so, Scott, uh, about a year ago you were telling me that you were at a, a hockey game in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, um, and you uh, received some texts or phone calls. Uh, uh, tell me about it. Well, it was just amazing. Well, the, the first text was interesting because I got a text from my friend saying, I hope it was autoerotic as- asphyxiation. And I was like, what? <laughs> I did it sort of out of the blue. It's like, that's such a thing. So, I turned, so there obviously had to be something I was missing because uh, I'd been I had been kind of out all day. And then, I, uh, you know, of course, I immediately Googled it and saw that uh, uh, Scalia had passed away. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was just, uh, you know, sort of having to process that and then, you know, frantically trying to sort of, you know, write a piece while I was, I was driving back. And that really seemed to be, you know, and, you know, leaving, leaving aside that you're never, you know, that, that, uh, a man died, but it certainly signaled, you know, what, what looked like a fairly momentous change in, um, American constitutional law. Not that I thought that Obama would be able to get a replacement pick. Um, but, you know, I certainly thought there was a very good chance that, uh, Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders would be picking the next Supreme Court justice. And this would have been the first time that there would be a Democratic median vote on the court since early in the Nixon administration. Uh, you That's know, right. it's, it's, it's been, uh, you know, almost 50 years now. Um, and it really looked like that opportunity was there. Um, and so, you know, to, to think back on how, you know, kind of, you know, in, in the wake of that, how naively optimistic I was. Um, given not only who is replacing Scalia, but uh, and essentially who's replacing Scalia is a 49-year-old version of Scalia, <laughs> but uh, but also uh, you know who would be picking the replacement? Uh, it's kind of <laughs> it's really uh, it's 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 still I still haven't uh, fully uh, put it together yet. Really, it's just, uh, just it still still feels like we're living in a in a, in a bit of a uh, of a nightmare. Right, and that um, uh, that uh, judge you're talking about, of course, is Neil Gorsuch, who was. Um, uh, nominated this week by Donald Trump. And I want to get into the specifics of, uh, of Gorsuch's record so that people uh, understand it. And, um, and also, you know, I, I want to talk about the, uh, once we, we discuss Gorsuch, how much things are going to change. I mean, you mentioned that really uh, for the last 45 some odd years or so, Nixon administration, um, we have had a, an, at least an ideologically uh, right-leaning uh, court, as opposed to you know left-leaning. Uh, you know, uh, people can argue about how liberal the liberal wing it was and how conservative the conservative wing was, but you know, in broad strokes. And I want to talk about how much how much is going to change from that. Is it just going to be more of the same of what you got used to? But before we get to any of that, I want to start by just um, talking about what your perspective is the Democrats should do in handling this nomination aside from the merits of Gorsuch as such, right? Because I am of the mind that short of Pam Carlin, uh, and maybe even then, the Democrats, uh, Democratic senators should in no way um, um, help the process of this nomination going along because of what I call the McConnell rule, which is what uh, the Republicans operated in over the past year since uh, Scalia's death. Yeah, I'm 100. Uh, if, if, if you'll forgive the plug, I actually have a piece in, in the New Republic uh, making exactly that argument uh, that, you know, to me, this is a, a no brainer that essentially there are two each independently sufficient reasons to, to filibuster um, and delay Gorsuch. Um, you know, the first is, as you say, that is essentially a stolen Supreme Court seat, that McConnell made up this new tradition that, you know, a year left in a president's term, you know, essentially his appointment power vanishes. Um, so that's the first, uh, you know, so that's, you know, the first reason is that essentially to, um, you know, just allow a straightforward, you know, up and down vote on Gorsuch would essentially legitimize that process. Uh you know, and there's no way to bring that norm back. But, you know, the Democrats should be drawing a line under the fact that there was a norm and uh, McConnell um, essentially violated it. And it's particularly galling, you know, given the fact that, you know, the Democrats have now won um, the popular vote in seven of the last nine elections. So it'd be one thing if there was the Supreme Court blockade and the Republican candidate actually, you know, clearly won. Um, you know, I'd still be upset about it, but then you can say, well, you know, fair enough. But, you know, in this case, you know, despite everything that went on with the FBI and the heirs of Clinton's campaign, you know, she still won by nearly three million votes. So we don't have a Republican Supreme Court because that's the direction the American people are heading in. You know, we have one because of 
various deficiencies. And the Republicans, you know, benefit not just from the Electoral College, but also from the malapportionment of the Senate. Um, that if we had democratic elections for those two offices, um, we, you know, we would not have Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. So to me, I really think that the circumstances of this election make the sort of theft of that seat particularly strong. And, and just in general, I think Democrats need to be hammering on this, that, you know, Donald Trump is formally entitled to the office based on the rules. That doesn't make him a legitimate president. <laughs> you know, and, and this is, I think, a good occasion to make that. And then secondly, I think the Democrats should filibuster him anyway, because, you know, he's a replacement of, of Scalia with a bad constitutional vision. And, uh, you know, the fact is the norm that we just allow presidents to pick any candidate who's remotely qualified, that's clearly out the window. You know, Garland is actually much more moderate than Gorsuch is, I don't and the Republican so. perspective is that he can't be accepted, so... <laughs> Now, let me ask you this, too, before. So, you know, uh, staying on this sort of theme of, of how the Democrats should um, uh, should uh, approach the, the Gorsuch nomination. And then we can uh, we can talk about what Gorsuch is going to mean for this country for mm-hmm. at, you know, could very well be 35, 40 years um, right. uh, going Absolutely. forward. But, uh, you know, um, uh, apparently Neil Gorsuch, back when he was an attorney, um, uh, wrote in the National Review Online uh, a piece uh, basically suggesting or um, uh, encouraging uh, the idea that liberals shouldn't pursue so much through the Supreme Court. Uh, that's all well and good, but in that piece he said, he wrote, the politicization of the judiciary undermines the only real asset it has, its independence. Judges come to be seen as politicians and their confirmations become just another avenue of political warfare. Respect for the role of judges and the legitimacy of the judiciary branch as a whole diminishes. The judiciary's diminishing claim to neutrality and independence is exemplified by recent historic shift in the Senate's confirmation process. He wrote this in 2005. If there's been any (laughs) change in the uh, Senate's confirmation uh, process, historic, we just saw that this past year. I mean, from your perspective, if Gorsuch gets on the Supreme Court, should he a should Democrats throughout the entire process ask him if he thinks that his uh, that his placement on that court uh, delegitimize the court and b should this guy have an asterisk uh, alongside his uh, his appointment and every one of his decisions? Yeah, I, I, I agree on both counts. There's a lot of an, and I assume that uh, someone on Pat Leahy's staff has uh, <laughs> provided him with that article. I suspect we're going to be hearing quotes from it. And I like to touch that, you know, he blames the fact that sometimes liberals win cases for the reason that, that the courts are perceived as political. You know, that mm. apparently it's only, you know, the court is only apolitical if liberals never win anything. But, but you know, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that this is, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, that, that you believe in this, you know, this idea of judicial independence, um, you know, you can't do much more to damage that than by simply blockading the Supreme Court. And again, not because of any objection to a nominee or any objection to their qualifications, like what happened to the Bork, which is simply, you know, they announce, you know, in principle that Barack Obama should not be able to fill a seat. And you'll remember that they tried to do that with the D.C. Circuit, um, you know, yep. you know, in the middle of, you know, bef- you know, in the first half of Obama's second term. So if Republicans had controlled the Senate in 2013, Obama essentially would have prevented from making any uh, appointments to the federal courts. Um, that you know, the McConnell rule is essentially that you know a Democratic president cannot make federal judicial appointments while Republicans control the Senate. <laughs> you know, so Indeed. that's uh, you know that that's going to be a pretty so you know it's it's that's definitely something that needs to be brought up. And just as you know, I like Charlie Pierce's suggestion that you know President Trump should always have an asterisk. And, you know, I think that that definitely goes, you know, th- this is for his nominee twice over because, um, you know, Trump shouldn't be president and, um, you know, he should never have had the Supreme Court vacancy to deal with. So it almost almost needs a double asterisk. 